All right, welcome. Here we are, Miami Book Fair 2015. Fantastic. Our very first guest today, leading off our coverage, is Steve Scheinkin, who's written a book called Most Dangerous, Daniel Ellsberg and the Secret History of the Vietnam War. Welcome, yeah. first of all. Thank you so much. Very so cool great to be to here. have you. Yeah, it's great this to be book, here. This uh, book was nominated for the National Book Award. It was a finalist in the National Book right. Awards that were just announced on Wednesday. Congratulations. You've, you've made a habit of making that National Book Award finalist list. Yeah, it's a good habit. Yeah. If I can keep it going. Let's keep it going. <laughs> yeah. All of your books are rooted in real historical events. Right. And this one's no different. Daniel Ellsberg, uh, the, the title is Most Dangerous, comes from a quote uh, by Henry Kissinger, who famously said, or perhaps not so famously to the audience you're writing to, that Daniel Ellsberg was one of the most dangerous people in America. Why? That's right. Yeah, that, and that's exactly where I began with that why, because I honestly didn't know. And it is a different book for people who remember the Vietnam era as opposed to people who don't. And I wanted to address both of those audiences, but especially people who don't. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting to begin with that question. What could someone do to be called by Kissinger, who's the right-hand man to the President Nixon, um, the most dangerous man in America? He must be stopped at all costs. What could somebody do to provoke that kind of wrath? And that's exactly what I started with that question because I thought it would make for exactly the setup to the kind of book I was writing or hoping to write, really a kind of a political thriller with, with a bit of a crime novel aspect to it. It's all true, but it has those twists and turns that I love in books when I sit down to read. Yeah, all of your books, again, rooted in real life stuff, but they read yeah. like fiction. This could have been a novel. Um, it's mm. a nonfiction story, but it, to me it read like I was reading a fictional tale of, of this person who was ready to turn the Pentagon Papers into some, you know, incredible controversy. How do you take that, like, real historical data, this from the Vietnam War era, mm -hmm. Daniel Ellsberg, and turn it into something that you think kids will really want to read and pull them through the book? Well, thanks for saying that. That's just exactly what you have to do. You know, years ago, I used to write history textbooks, which are terrible, and kids hate them. And all they do really is um, list names and dates and prove to kids, at least in their mind, that they don't like history. So I'd have to do the opposite and find stories and make them. It doesn't do any good to tell a young reader, oh, history is really cool. You have to, you have to prove it. So I, I search, that's a big part of it, is finding the stories that I can turn into these, hopefully these page turners, that will be as fun to read as any novel. And I happen to think true stories are even more exciting. And in a story like, like Daniel Ellsberg's story, it's, it would be almost too much to make up. The cast of characters, the twists and turns, the wa everything to do with Watergate and the bumbling attempts to break in to various offices, coming straight out of the White House. If you made it up, it might almost seem, I think it would seem ridiculous. Yeah, the cast of characters. I mean, you have, thankfully, I think, for even people who aren't <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, your target audience necessarily, pages of people that you mention in here that help you know, explain who Good. all these people are that you run across in the book. But, Tell us, because I don't think a lot of people maybe even know, who, who was Daniel Ellsberg and what was it about his story that Yeah, the basic in? thing. I mean, the, the thing that he's remembered, and I would say famous or infamous, I love characters who could make people, people think he's a hero and a villain, um, depending on who you ask. But he leaked a top secret document called the Pentagon Papers. It was really 7,000 pages of documents that exposed years of government lies about the Vietnam War. He was a, a consummate insider. He had worked in the Pentagon, and he had access to this, this stack of documents. And though when the war began, he was very pro-war. He was really a hawk. He'd been in the Marines. He was just the, he fancied himself an insider and prided himself on being a secret keeper. And it didn't matter what we were doing because we were right. We were on the right side of the Cold War. We were allowed to lie to the public. We're allowed to break the law. It doesn't matter. That's how he started. So his journey is very interesting because over the years of seeing this disconnect between what he's seeing, because he's seeing, as he would put it, the real dope coming straight out of Vietnam, and then he sees the president telling the people something different. Now he has access to these documents that prove that disconnect, but what do you do with them? I love those kind of moments. Would you, would you risk your life to release these documents? He figured he'd be burning every bridge, he'd be betraying every friend he ever had, he would probably spend his life in jail, never see his children again except maybe through bars. But on the other hand, he was willing to do anything to try and stop the war. And that's what he's remembered for mostly is that decision that he made. Yes, I'm going to 
he wouldn't use the word steal, but he, technically he did sneak them out of an office, photocopied them, gave them eventually to the New York Times, and that was the big headline moment. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the interesting things about the book as you're reading it is his slow disillusionment with, he was, as you said, he was very pro-war, he defended the war to people his own age, he was, yes. you know, he, but he was sucked in and he believed in what he was doing, but slowly but surely, like so many in the Vietnam War era, he started to lose faith in his own government and in what he was doing and had these, I mean, and had access to the Pentagon Papers, the secret history of Vietnam at his disposal. Yes. Um, what a burden for someone like it Daniel. It was, right? and, and, and that's what I love about his story is that it's a real kind of hero's journey in the classic, almost mythical sense. He, he lives it, he li and it's agonizing for him. You say burden, and that's right. It, was ag it took him a long time to admit to himself that there was something that he had to do. Mm -hmm. And there were, he went to Vietnam, he spent two years there, he saw the misery on the ground on both sides, on all sides of the war. And he really, it was gut-wrenching for him to come to this decision that he was gonna break with everything he'd ever believed. That story, what, one of the things that you, you mentioned, the hero's journey, and one of the things that I think um, kids will recognize is that he had to do it himself. He, he tried to enlist the help of people in the government Right. You said that he went to Fulbright. You said he went to McGovern. He tried to get people to help him um, he share this, and, and he couldn't. And he had to finally do it himself. In fact, he even enlisted his own children to photocopy some of the Pentagon That's papers That's probably my, maybe my favorite part of the story. He had two kids, one 13 and one 10. And he said, well, I may never see them again. So I want them to understand why I'm doing what I'm doing. I don't want them, the, the media is going to say, who knows what about me, that I'm crazy, a traitor. Let me explain to them at least what, what I'm doing so that they hear it from me first. Yeah. And then eventually, though it was not necessarily good parenting, he, um, he was divorced and he was visiting the kids and he wanted to do some photocopying, ended up taking them with him to this office where he was photocopying this top secret report. Right. And again, as if you, you wouldn't want to make this up, but as they're doing it, uh, the cop showed up because it turned out the office he was borrowing, he didn't know how to turn off the alarm. Yeah. So the cops come there, he's got this top secret paper spread out all over the floor. And in fact, his kids, their his job kids was scissors. to cut off the yeah. top secret stamps right. on the pages. And the, the cops came in and all they could think of was a family craft project. Yeah. It looks like that. So they just said, oh, don't worry about it. We'll turn off the alarm. And then they left. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> it's stories like that that I think make the story so readable. and so. Uh, interesting, and you take all these amazing sources. We talk about Philip Caputo in here, and yes. and you talk about uh, Neil Sheehan and the and the bright shining lie. Um, you you encapsulate some of that and you bring it in. And in the last couple minutes that we have, I'd love to hear about your approach to kind of cultivating all these sources and creating a really readable tale mm. for younger readers. Yeah, I do read a ton, and that's when I talk to young readers or students. That's the part that kind of sometimes they get scared. Do you really have to read all these? sources, and you really do. That is a, you have to like that part of the job. Right. I consider it like a, a nerdy detective work. Right. That's how I try to sell it. Yeah. So you do have to spend months or years, in, in some cases, reading and collecting the material. And then I use a technique straight out of screenwriting, which is to take a wall and just put all my best, best material on index cards, very 20th century. You could do it on a computer, too, but I like to see it and just build your story that way, really build your story out of all the best material, all the best true stories you can find. And luckily for a, a story like this, the sources are, are almost too good, they're almost too rich. Yeah. So you, you spend enormous amounts of time though researching yeah. this and you become very personally attached and then you have to go find another story. What is the magic moment where you decide, like, how does it happen that the, that the moment happens where you're like, this mm. is my next story, I want it, this is fascinating, I want to write and spend the next couple of years doing this? You do have to. I've, I've heard writers call it a relationship. You almost have to be in love with, if, if not your subject, the person literally, then the, the bigger subject that you're writing about. So I, I approach it cautiously. And I'll spend a week, I'll often spend a week researching a story and then turn away. Sometimes it's been longer than that because you do have to be very, very committed to living with that story. And you bring it home with you. You try to turn it off when you're with your kids, but you can't. It's with you that whole time. That's right. Well, I'm glad this one came into your Thank world. You. And I think that you, you called it nerdy, I think. But like, to me, nerdy is what's cool now. And I that's, think that, you know. That's the beauty of, of today. Nerdy is cool. Nerdy is cool. And everybody has their thing, whether it's science, whether it's yes. history. And you have an audience of people 
that love what you do and that are waiting for your next magic moment to hit you. Okay. Uh, I'm one of those people. I think this is wow, a book for adults you. too. It's really well written and really fun and well deserved of your National Book Award finalist status. Keep writing and then we'll see you on the next National Book Award I'll finalist. Be back. Yeah, let's bring you back again. <laughs> All right, thank you so yeah, much. This is really great fun. to have you. Thank great. you. Really great. Thanks so Thanks. much, Steve.